Hi everyone, my name is Oli. I'm a final year medical student at the University of Warwick in the UK. Today we are going to be returning to my medical school interview hot topic and preparation series. Kind of a return to my roots here on the channel. This series aims to tackle common medical interview stations and questions to help you prepare and make sure that you're not caught on the back foot when things come up on interview day. And today we're going to be talking about consent. And this is one of those terms that you hear bandied around all the time. It's really important when we're thinking about medical decision making and our relationship with patients. But what does it actually mean? Well, perhaps to start with the basics, consent is one of the most fundamental principles that you will come across within the NHS. And as such, it's fairly likely to appear in some form or another in your interview. And many of us would struggle to formally define it because it's a really tricky concept. But let's explore what it means in its more basic terms and then we'll try and apply it to some clinical context. Put most simply, consent is when one person or part we'll call that person A, voluntarily accepts or agrees to the desires of another person, let's call that person B. And this can of course happen in a very, very wide range of contexts. We might have this in healthcare, we might have this under the law, we have this when purchasing things, for example, or just having relationships with our friends and with other people. At varying levels, consent always tends to be involved. And there are several types of consent, which might make this a bit clearer for you. The first is express consent, one that is very clearly given and stated by the person. Now this might be spoken, it could be written, or it could be given non-verbally by some other gesture, such as nodding to say yes, or shaking your head to indicate that you don't want something. And in cases where we don't have written evidence, it's really important to have some other form that indicated that consent took place. You might have an audio recording or a video, for example. You may also have heard about something called informed consent, which again is consent, but it has particular connotations and implications such that risks and benefits are important. All surgery, for example, any surgical operation or indeed most treatments that people have on the NHS require informed consent. So in the case of a surgery, that will involve the surgeon specifically sitting down with the patient and going through with them in detail the possible risks and the possible benefits of the operation that the patient's about to have. So let's say in the example of a hip replacement, we are doing this hip replacement in order to restore you some mobility in your leg and reduce your pain. The way we're going to do that is by putting in a false hip that replaces the damaged joint you already have. There are risks, however, with operations like these. There are chances that you might develop a blood clot, you might develop a skin infection from the surgical site, or the joint itself may become infected, you may become septic, and you may die. Now, of course, particularly the latter case, incredibly unlikely but a possible consequence that that patient might want to weigh up. You don't know what's going to be important for a particular patient, so it's really important to have that conversation and identify the risks and benefits that they're most concerned about, as well as the ones that they might not have thought of. Then we come on to something a little bit more nebulous called implied consent, which can act as consent, but it's not expressly given. And we need to be really clear that this doesn't mean that consent wasn't given, but that it was communicated in some other way, potentially. Even that it was given by inaction or silence on the part of someone. Just to think of some really common examples of this, one might be blood taking, where if I come towards a patient with a needle saying, I'm going to take your blood now, and the patient proffers their arm forward to me and doesn't resist at any point during the procedure, even though they didn't expressly give me their permission for that procedure to take place, you could argue that consent was given through lack of resistance. But as with anything, particularly a healthcare intervention, you need to get formal consent officially and you should document it as well. And usually you'll have a form, for example, when blood taking is done for the patient to fill out. Sexual activity usually takes place through implied consent as well, although obviously this has some major problems. Or even just physical contact between two participants in a game like football or rugby. You just kind of accept that by being there and by playing the game, that people could potentially come into physical harm. It's just accepted by everyone even if you know no such forms have been signed. It's also the case that different types of consent that we might want to give sometimes have age limits attached to them under UK law. Coming back to sexual consent for a minute, in the UK, the age at which someone can give sexual consent is 16, for example, whereas their ability to accept medical treatment 
relies instead on something called Gillick competence, which we've discussed in another video. Go and see the bar at the top for that, but Gillick competence can actually come into force at an age below 16. It depends on the particular child. Although even if they were deemed to be Gillick competent and accept some sort of life-saving treatment or treatment at all, they wouldn't be able to refuse life-saving treatment until they reach the age of 18. So just a reminder that consent is very rarely a blanket situation and it can be very nuanced. One of the key things to remember is that in medicine and in healthcare, the clinicians, the physicians, the doctors always have a duty to obtain informed consent before you make any kind of intervention. That consent can only be given by someone who is appropriately, you know, reasoning and understanding enough to make that decision for themselves. And if it becomes clear down the line that that doctor, that nurse, that medical student did not get appropriate consent and did not document it properly, then they could very well face legal or professional consequences, especially if that patient hasn't been fully informed or has actually been misled. We're about halfway through the video now, guys. I'd find it so, so helpful if you're able to hit that like button for me and subscribe to the channel to make sure that you don't miss any future videos in this series. Thank you so much and let's return to the video. Just to cover some edge cases, there are obviously situations in which medical professionals need to act when they can't necessarily get consent from the patient. For example, if you're attending a road traffic accident and the patients are unconscious and bleeding out, you cannot wake them up and get consent. You need to act in order to prolong and preserve life. In most situations, this is covered by something called the doctrine of necessity, which allows people to do things that would normally be illegal, such as giving treatments or physically manhandling someone, in order to preserve life, or crucially, to prevent serious deterioration in condition. And this is how in emergencies, doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals are able to try and resuscitate people without express consent. And they don't have the fear of being sued afterwards if things go wrong, as long as they were acting in that person's best interest. So thinking about an example like CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, that's a mouthful, uh, in cases where CPR is performed, there are huge risks to doing CPR because of the physical level of force required to do it properly. You could bruise them, you could crack their ribs, you could even puncture a lung. But all of these things would be deemed reasonable given the emergency nature of the situation and what you need to do to try and keep them alive. The only situation in which this wouldn't be acceptable, for example, is if that patient has a known do not attempt resuscitation, a DNR or a DNA CPR notice already in place, in which case it would be completely not permissible to attempt CPR on them at all. And just to close this video, a note on DNRs, because we've been hearing a lot about them in the wake of COVID and seriously ill patients. A DNR, a do not resuscitate order, is the withholding of treatment, that is withholding of CPR, that would normally be used in order to prolong or sustain life. So it's almost like a form of passive euthanasia that is not doing something and allowing nature to take its course, which is permissible under UK law. And this is typically done in situations where CPR will either not help with cardiac output or sustain breathing. There will be no net benefit to the patient. So for example, if someone's had their head cut off, you can do CPR till the cows come home, but it won't help the patient. Or finally, in situations where the net harms are likely to outweigh any net benefit or gain that the patient might experience. And while they are clinical decisions, a DNR or a decision to not commence CPR on someone is a clinical decision that has to be made by a doctor. They must be discussed with the patient themselves, the patient's family, or if someone has power of attorney to make health decisions for someone, you should discuss it with them as well. But by the same token, someone can't demand CPR and a patient's family can't demand that you do CPR if the doctor looking after them thinks that it would be futile or the net benefits would not outweigh the harms. As I said, it's a clinical decision that is made by the clinician. And with that, guys, that wraps up this video on consent. I hope you found it useful and informative. Let me know any questions in the comments below. I'd be really grateful to try and answer them or refer you to my colleagues if I can't. And it's now medical interview season. So while unfortunately this year, I'm not going to be offering mock interviews, I've got final exams and job applications to deal with, and that's causing me no small amount of stress. I am trying to keep 
keep everything ticking along for you guys as you need the content. So please let me know in the comments what stations, what questions you're struggling with. I'd be really happy to try and help out. Take care guys and I'll see you next time. So thanks very much for watching guys. There are three ways you can support the channel. The first is by dropping a like on this video and sharing it with a friend, hitting subscribe if you found it really useful. The second is you can buy me a coffee using my Ko-Fi link to help keep me awake during the editing process. And then third is you can save 10% off your first year's subscription to Complete Anatomy 2021 using my referral link in the description below. Take care and I'll see you next time.